welcome to Inside Out. Um, our purpose here this evening, for those of you who have never had a chance to join us before, is to linger for a while um, uh, on an example of the best in American science and medical writing, and with the consent and the connivance of the author of that work, dissect it, uh, take uh, it as a stellar example of craft um, from which we can all learn. Um, I should say at the outset that this is a conversation, not a lecture, um, and that I, I uh, both encourage and insist on your interruptions. Uh, what makes for uh, the best kind of uh, inside out um, is a digression that is prompted by someone who uses the microphone that uh, Dan has uh, got. So if you'd like to ask a question, just get his attention so that we can capture that for people who might want to watch this later on the web. Um, we live uh, in a golden age of science and medical writing. Uh, I think it, it's, uh, you'd have to go back to the, la to, the, to the 19th century to find a time uh, when uh, uh, the literature of the laboratory um, of the clinic um, played such a big uh, role in popular uh, reading. And um, unlike our, our current uh, professional uh, writing culture, um, there is a, a, a rich tradition of practitioners and scientists themselves uh, being the ones who write eloquently about uh, new developments directly for the public. And one, Darwin, of course, is, is the, the prime example of this. But it used to be the main channel of communication from the laboratory uh, to the public. And in recent years, we've really seen a revival of this, partly through the dynamics of uh, the publishing business, partly through uh, a renewed uh, interest of the general public, and partly because a, a generation of unusually eloquent uh, and energetic uh, practitioners and scientists have come to the fore who themselves write brilliantly. We're very, very fortunate this evening that we have one of those people with us tonight, Siddhartha Mukherjee. I thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, a, uh, officially an assistant professor of medicine at Columbia University uptown, and he's also a staff uh, cancer physician at the Columbia University Medical Center. Um, he is also author of the book that we are here to discuss this evening, um, The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer. This is a book that uh, has been uh, named by the New York Times as one of the 10 best books of uh, 2010, um, one of the top 10 nonfiction books by Time Magazine, and in that uh, uh, laying on of hands that all uh, authors today uh, seek and are blessed to receive, named uh, by Oprah. Um, as one of uh, her top 10 books of, of 2010. Um, what we're going to do, normally we talk to a journalist. We talk to a, a, uh, a person whose who's, uh, main practice is, is uh, writing. But occasionally we do like to look at this and we're informed by this, from the view from the other side of the fence. In, uh, in past uh, seasons we've been fortunate to have uh, Nobel laureate Frank Wilczek, for instance, uh, uh, Nobel laureate Roald Hoffman come talk about their efforts to communicate directly about their particular research obsessions to the general public. Um, what's unusual, I think, about this book and about you as a, as a writer is that you are not um, putting out your theory of how this works. You're not uh, uh, giving us your version of the Higgs boson that you're chasing or whatever. You have actually kind of tackled the history and the character of a medical field. And uh, that on the one hand is uh, very ambitious, but it's so uh, selfless, if I can put it in such a funny way. So let's explore for a minute your pedigree as a writer. Now, I know that uh, uh, you come uh, uh, to your current position through Stanford, where you were an undergraduate. Um, there you, you wrote for the Stanford Daily. Yeah, yeah, you've written um, as a uh, generalist for the New England Journal, for Nature, you've done book reviews. Um, but you know, when I was preparing for this, I couldn't help but notice that prior to this current book, the, the writing that you seem more in, uh, in tune with was the classical peer-reviewed medical literature. I just pulled this one at random, uh, paper published early in your career, 
uh, murine cytotoxic T lymphocytes recognize an epitome in an EBNA1 fragment, but fail to lyse EBNA1 expressing mouse cells. This, this is not the kind of pro style that gets you up to the top 10 list. So I wonder if you could just um, start our conversation. Tell me a little bit about your pedigree as a writer. Your pedigree as a doctor is well documented. You know, Stanford, Harvard, Columbia, um, the New England Journal. How did you develop as a writer? I'm told you used to memorize great wads of poetry when you were young. Is that where it starts? Well, I think it, I mean, I think it starts with an interest in storytelling. Uh, I talk about that it actually in this book uh, very much so. Um, it starts off with, um, I think, I think if I have, as you're pointing out, I had no theory to expound. I have only one theory to expound about writing, which is uh, good writing comes, comes from good reading. Um, and so um, I think of myself primarily as a reader. Um, and I, I try to incorporate all of that into this, into this book. Um, I think uh, one of the things that's interesting to me in the writing of this book in particular um, was that long before I knew the content of this book, um, I knew its mood. Um, I knew its mood. Yeah, I, I had a set of, I had a sense of what. I mean, you know, I was thinking about writing this book. It was obviously an ambitious project. I had never done anything like this before. Um, it, it, the content was so enormous. I mean, just this last year, there were three hundred thousand books published, uh, three hundred thousand journal articles published on cancer. So you can see, you're, you're, the, you, there's sort of like a fire hose of information coming at you. And your job, in, in my job in writing a book like this, was to try to get at um, sort of hitting the, high, hitting the main important pieces of that information. But long before all of that happened, I spent a lot of time thinking to myself, what, what should one feel like uh, in inhabiting this book? Um, and uh, One, the reader. The reader, yeah. What should the reader feel like? And I gravitated to a couple of books that were very important for that. Uh, for that, I, and I learned from them. I sort of, you know, really tried, spent a lot of time. I read and reread those books, and I'll name them. We'll talk a little bit about them in more detail. I, I, I was particularly interested in Richard Rhodes' book. I was very struck by that. You, you mentioned that in your acknowledgments, and yes. yeah. lots of medical books, and then suddenly this famously well done history of the making of the atomic bomb. Yes, so I was very, I was very. There were many, there were very, and I'll talk, I can talk more in detail about what exactly. So there was Richard Rhodes' book, which I thought was particularly interesting to me. Um, then there was, uh, I'll mention four books, and they're very different, and that's, again, trying to capture the set of relationships here. The second book was Tony Judd's book, which had just come out. Tony, Tony was a friend, is, was hmm. a friend, um, co called Post War. Um, uh, and so that was the second one. The third one um, is the one that's perhaps most in the left field, but the one that I probably returned to the most often, formally, um, and that is Primo Levi's book, um, Survival in Auschwitz, which I came back Survival to. Survival in Auschwitz, yeah, yeah. I came back to over and over again. I had read his other works, um, and the, I came back to his other works as well, but I came back to Survival in Auschwitz over and over again. And then finally, uh, a book that is writ large through this book, but in fact, a book that I don't borrow very much from formally, which is Susan Sontag's uh, Illness as Metaphor. Um, so there were sort of four books, and if you can imagine, there are sort of four books in mid-space. Uh, I, 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 I have a very peculiar personal manner of writing, which is I, I, I figured this out. As I, when I was starting out this book, I, um, I thought I, I bought myself a very nice desk and a beautiful chair. Um, and I, I set myself up by the window, and I said, you know, this was in Cambridge. I was in, I was in Harvard then, and I set myself by the window, and I spent hour after hour writing absolutely nothing. And when I wrote something, it was complete junk. Um, and so then I moved downstairs to the living room, and I set, set myself up there, and I wrote nothing again. And so finally, after five or six such attempts, I ended up in bed, um, and I wrote my entire book in bed. Uh, I would. You know, literally, I, I would put all these books underneath my, so Richard Rose's book, all these books would be stacked underneath the bed. I could reach into them and I could pull them out. Um, and on mornings, like everyone else would go off to work and I would be sort of like the person in pajamas writing in bed. 
I have to ask, I mean, did your wife have feelings about you turning the bed into like your work area here, your, your, well, there were limits uh, your library? I mean, <laughs> did you just like stack books on your half? On my half, exactly. Uh -huh, I, see. Yeah, I see. Exactly. I see. Yeah. I see. Um, uh, and so mo most, most recently, you know, I've been writing grants. We, I, we had a big paper out last year in Nature and mm -hmm. so forth. So, and I realized to myself that if, you know, if, if, if that what works, don't fix it. So um, I, I just recently moved my office to Columbia. And for the first time in my life, I was given the luxury of, you know, choosing things for my office. People choose desks and chairs and so forth. And so I moved a bed into I was going to do it. I can't believe that. You moved a bed in. Yeah, so I moved a bed into my office thinking yeah. to myself, you know, since it's the only place I can get work done in, you know, why, why fight? So okay. if you ever were to come up, there is literally, I kid you not, there is literally a, I mean, it's folded up for the most part. Ah, I but it's, say, this could send a bad <laughs> signal, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, so I moved a bed into my office and I, I, I've been, you know, productive that way. But anyway, um, so... So you write but to, in bed. But, but, but to more serious, yeah, exactly. No. Yeah, to, but to more serious points, you know, when b back, back to the point of Richard mm. Rhodes' book and right. back to the point of, so I, I, I had something of, I borrowed something from Richard about the way he enters this book, again, in a very selfless manner. Um, he has the contemplative quality of, of someone observing a, an enormous moment in history a moment in history that you know did really defines the beginning of the atomic age for us but yet his touch in that book is so sparing um, that it's unbelievable it's almost hmm. like it's almost like you can move through the entire book that the uh, people who've read it might realize that with the opening the opening mm -hmm. page of that book is a real masterwork in, mm -hmm. in in just being the way it's crafted it brings you to a moment in history uh, where leo zillard is stepping off a curb in london and that, um, that little thing that happens, Leo Zillard steps off a curb, of course becomes uh, such a large metaphor because it is in fact mankind that's stepping off a curb, right? But you don't realize that at the first uh, moment in that book. This is before the atom is first split. Um, and just taking you into this pre-atomic world, this naive, innocent world before atomic weapons, before we unleash the power of the atom. And I was thinking about this more recently because of what's happening in Japan. Hmm. Um, so anyway, so that was hmm. one thing. Uh, a, one a, a tone, a tone. A tone, exactly, a tone, a, a kind of contemplative tone, a, a, a kind of um, a deeply, deeply crafted in the sense he really wanted to find out every little piece. What was the intersection between whatever, Bloomsburg, Bloomsbury Avenue and mm -hmm. Shaftesbury Avenue? What is it like to be there? Well, what is okay. it like to visit there? Th th that kind of tone to inhabit, to bring to, to that place. Um, and then in contrast, I mean, again, just in the stark contrast, and yet achieving the same effect, uh, anyone who, people who've read Primo Levi's book, um, again, that book is, man is motivated by tone. And the tone that, that's very important to me in that book is, is survival in Auschwitz is a cool book. Um, and yet, cool in a it, sense of being remote. Yeah, uh, uh, in, or, in or sense detached, of temperature. Detached, yeah. Yeah. Or, or perhaps detached, but in temperature. It's, it's a very cool book. And yet it's, it's precisely the temperature of the book that reminds us how deep, um, how hmm. the depth of what is happening here. I mean, the, this is really the, one of the quintessential tomes of um, suffering in the camps, right? Now again, I don't want to make a, an idiotic analogy between my book and survival in Auschwitz, but the, 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 mo the more interesting thing to me was how does one, as a writer, achieve that place where you can convey information in a way that encourages a kind of dialogue almost with, with a reader, um, but does so in a, in a sparing way, um, in a way that's, that's not, you know, it's interesting to me, I, I would often reread sentences from either Richard's or, or, or uh, Primo's book and I would wonder, you know, if there are three words that are changed in, in that sentence, the mm. entire tone of that sentence would change. The entire tone of the book would change. So how does one create, how does one then create that tone? So this is a very long way of saying that I had first imagined the tone of my book, the mood of my book, long before I had imagined the content of the book. Mm. Um, and that was my first step. Well, you clearly, at the outset, made a very interesting decision right. about, um, this book, which is to cast what is in fact a, a history uh, yeah. of the study and experience of cancer from 
prehistoric times, well, 2500 BC or so, uh, to the present. Uh, not as a history, not as a uh, technical adventure story, of, uh, but as a biography of a disease. Right. Um, what was your idea there? Why well, so, you, you know, uh, th 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 there were, uh, that is a complicated, uh, as you can imagine, particularly for a scientist, that is a complicated, uh, 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 that is a complicated step. And by, by that I mean the following. I mean, um, using the word biography in the context of disease always brings up the specter for a scientist of over-anthropomorphizing disease or illness. Um, um, and yet, on the flip side, I kept saying to myself, well, my, when my patients, when patients encounter illness, particularly when they encounter cancer, it happens to be the illness that I'm most familiar with, um, they do imagine uh, themselves uh, inhabiting, as Susan Sontag very, very much put it, as becoming citizens of another country, mm -hmm. um, visiting another kingdom, you know, th th the opening quote of the book I'll read in a second. Um, their imagination is one of, is a very visceral imagination. It's not an imagination of history, it's an imagination of inhabitation. They inhabit a different place. Someone, they, they imagine illness in a very, very visceral, as I said, way. And so I said to myself, you know, if that's the case, then why, why beat around the bush about it? Why not then call this book a biography? Because in general, of course, I, the, the, the original subtitle of the book was A History of Cancer, and it just didn't feel right to the project. It didn't feel appropriate to the project. In other words, um, Historians generally don't tend to enter their own histories. Uh, you know, sometimes they do, but they generally don't tend to. The project seemed too visceral, and in the end, I kept thinking to myself, you know, I'm drawing a portrait of something over time. I'm drawing a portrait of breast cancer in 1850, and the same portrait again in 1890, the same portrait again with changes in 1910, in 1950, in 200, in 2000, and that is a biography, you know this idea of repeatedly revisiting the same portrait, the idea, the imagination of breast cancer in this, in this particular case. And so I said, finally, I, at the end, actually, the, 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 the subtitle history had persisted right through the penultimate draft. Oh, really? And then I, had, hmm. I changed that in the end and said, well, you know, this, to me, this project feels more like, as I said, biography. And it's, that, 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 that change, that shift, uh, was and continues to be criticized. Uh, some people don't like that. Some people don't like the idea of, of, of recasting this as biography. Um, and I, I think that, that, that leads to an interesting conversation usually. And so I sort of put it out there as, 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 a, more, as, as a more provocative way of thinking about this book. Well, I thought it did a very, it had a very interesting effect. I mean, cancer as a topic, um, right. as a condition, uh, as a cultural metaphor, I mean, it's, a, it's very high pitch, it's very charged, and there's a very high level of propagandizing that, that goes on, right. um, uh, which you uh, delve into in some portions of your book when you're talking about the Laskers, for instance. Um, I thought that by casting this biography had, had the, the effect of somehow taking that down a notch right. and allowing a certain distance um, that was informative. So introduce us to this character. Uh, that you're writing a biography of. Introduce us to, to, to uh, the, the personage of cancer. Sure. I mean, it's a little bit like, I mean, I, I, there's a quote here that I, that I picked up from Lewis Carroll, which is, you know, um, uh, you know the, the, in the hunting of the snark, they, the, this team of people goes out to hunt the snark. Um, hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've read Carroll, one of Carroll's last somewhat mad poems um, with all sorts of mathematical inferences inside the poem, but anyway, um, and in the end, the, the, the snark that they're, everyone's going out to hunt basically vanishes into nothing. It becomes, the hunt becomes a kind of futile hunt. Um, and uh, to some extent, I think some of the, I actually use that in the book, uh, to some extent it happens uh, to cancer. In the 1940s, 1910s, we imagine that there is one monolithic entity called cancer, big C cancer, for which there will be one monolithic big C cure with one medicine um, or one series of medicines, one family of medicines, and as we enter the, the actual history, that begins to fade away. It become, begins to become infinitely more slippery. Um, and that, to me, is, was very interesting as an idea. I mean, what does one do in the face of that uncertainty? How do we respond, not only as patients, but as advocates, as doctors, as scientists, to something that begins to now diversify so enormously
that it begins to become not just one disease, but many diseases. I mean, we now know that one breast cancer doesn't resemble a second breast cancer. Um, so the fact that they happen to arise in the same anatomical organ belies an incredible degree of, of difference. And yet, of course, if you take the family of breast cancers, there are some deep resemblances between them uh, compared to the family of, uh, of prostate cancer. It's a little bit becomes like recognizing the human face, right? I mean, we know that there are certain fundamental features of anatomy that connect human faces. And obviously, we know that faces often come in families. And yet, the family of one face has no resemblance to the family of another face. And yet, we can have a reasonable conversation about what a face is, right? And so, so, so some of that begins to happen with cancer. And to me, what was interesting is, in the face of that, in the face of that uncertainty, in the face of that di diversity, what is the response? Um, some of the response is to grapple with simplicities, to grapple with, again, the big C cure. Some other responses are, you know, to try to look for these underlying themes. So the answer to your question of what is the, what is the character of this, of this cancer, this thing, this entity cancer, um, it, is a, it, is a, it is infinitely slippery. It begins, it starts off as one thing, but by the end of the book we realize it's quite something different. Um, culturally it's different, metaphorically it's different, and most importantly biologically it's very different. How, how did this project originate for you? I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very struck, for instance, to hear you say that the idea of casting as a biography came almost at the end of the project rather than as a, an initial organizing right. principle, because frankly it's so neat. Um, but uh, you know, you're a prolific, uh, run a prolific lab, um, you have papers coming out all the time, uh, I'm sure you've got uh, postdocs nagging at you, you have uh, patients, um, cancer patients who uh, are uh, a claim, uh, their mortality is a claim on your time. Um, where did this come from? Well, I mean, it, one major impetus was that there was a, I felt that while I was a fellow in training, I felt there was a big vacuum in this literature. I mean, there was a kind of, um, you can go onto a bookstore, you can look on Amazon, there are 5,000 books on cancer. Uh, but the kind of book they were was the kind of book that I was least interested in reading myself. Um, you know, eat chiggers and it'll cure colon cancer or some nonsense like that. Um, and. And so I felt as if the, this vacuum was, a va and sophisticated readers, uh, I felt as if we sort of almost owed something to patients. Because here they were asking extremely sophisticated questions. Uh, and you could say that it was true for our culture. Here our culture is asking very sophisticated questions, journalistic questions about <laughs> cancer. What is cancer? What happens next? Where, where are we now? What happens next? How do we get here? Um, is cancer increasing? Is it decreasing? Are we dying more of cancer? Are we dying? Less of cancer, are there more carcinogens? Are there less carcinogens? These questions are, are deeply part of our public conversation. And yet, there, there was a, I, I felt as there was very few attempts to sort of take a step back and say, well, what is the story? What is the larger story behind these sort of conversations that are happening in a, in a kind of uh, super stratum, uh, as it were? What is, this, what is the deeper structure? What is the history? And then patients actually began to ask me this quest these questions. You know, someone during an interlude on the treatment of breast cancer would say, well, how did we, how did, how did we ever know that tamoxifen works? How did we get to this point? Or someone else would ask, you know, who discovered X, Y, or Z, right? Um, and I felt as if all of this could be, there was a story behind all this. There was a connection of the series of links. Um, and so I began to keep a journal. Um, uh, often recording these questions, I put circles around them and come back to them and so forth. And then by the end of my first year of fellowship, I had ended up with almost four di three or four diaries worth of notes. Of so these journey. are this is a, a conversation with yourself. You're sort right, of having kind an of internal an internal conversation, exactly. Uh, not not a diary in a no, not a diary in a day to day yeah. kind of traditional sense. Okay. Um, and so then I began to sort of wonder if I if I had this, you know, four or five notepads worth of diaries, um, how, how does one put this together? What was the, what were the next series of steps that would convert this into, a, into, in, into this, into a document that is really a story with a beginning in the middle and an end, um, or somewhat of an end. Uh, uh, and, and that's how the project grew. Okay, well, you know, we're students of craft here, so, so on the one hand, this is very interesting that you kept uh, a kind of open-ended uh, journal. Yeah. Um, did you then turn this into a proposal? Did you get an agent? How does it work from, from your side? Uh, you're not uh, 
you know, a Nobel laureate uh, yet, uh, 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 you are not unlike uh, us here, um, a, a, a writer starting out uh, uh, with, a, with a day job, um, right. uh, trying to find uh, uh, somebody to get interested in what is not a beginning project. This is a, this is a fairly massive undertaking you're thinking about. How did, how did you frame this as a, as a business proposal, I mean, as right. a proposition? What did so you I'll do? I'll give, you two, I'll give you two points about that. The first of all, uh, the first point is about writing as an expert versus a non-expert. Mm -hmm. It was very, very important to write this book for me as a non-expert. I could not have written this book as a Nobel laureate, just to use one example. But, to you, but, but to, if I had a kind of uh, inflated sense of seniority, Mm -hmm. um, uh, in writing this book, I think I would be this book. Be, I would be physically unable to write this book. This would, book would not have would not come out the way it did. Um, there is something about I think the I hope there is something about not propounding a theory, not having an ego to. I mean, I have my own ego. I'm not saying that I'm egoless. But I'm saying, but not having a particular mm -hmm. agenda to grind, mm -hmm. um, which allows this kind of book to happen. Again, this goes back to the books that I was talking about. You know. Richard mm -hmm. was not casting himself out to be the, the new historian of the atomic age, right? He was writing a book very specifically about uh, the making of the atomic bomb, which happens to tell us that, that you know, it happens to inaugurate the right, history. Right, but yeah. just for the sake of discussion, Richard yeah. Rhodes is a historian. I understand. He's that. not a nuclear physicist. Yes. He's, you know, he's not a Richard Feynman. He's not a Robert Eimannheimer. He's not an I. I. Robbie. He's not in there. Right, uh, uh, playing the game. He's right. he's an onlooker. Yes. Now you're 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 doing both. You are in there as an oncologist, as a researcher, as a practicing physician. Um, but most importantly, I'm not Richard Feynman. Well, yeah. right. you know, there there are times when I think Richard <laughs> Feynman wasn't Richard Feynman. <laughs> right. But but most importantly, I was, I'm not. You know, as I said, the, 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 just the gaze, as it were, yeah. was uh -huh. not one of an expert. Uh -huh. The gaze was one of discovery. I was more interested in discovering my history rather than narrating to you what my history was. Um, right. And that process of discovery was important. And I'll come back to some specific instances yeah. of that in a second. Um, and the second question is, how does one do this practically, uh, mm. mechanically? Um, so it turns out that I was, even though I was producing stuff in bed, I was unable to write a proposal, absolutely unable to write a proposal. Because every time I would write a proposal, I would try to say to, my, try to, say to someone who's going to read this proposal, you know, this is how I intend to write this book. So it was like, you know, imagine it was like it was it was one step away from the actual writing of the book. Huh. It was telling someone this will be the content, and to me that felt very empty. Partly because I happen to have written books, or sorry, happen to have written articles about. You know, in science, you don't ever tell someone this is my future theory about something or the other, right? <laughs> If someone takes, if you read an article which says this is my future theory, that goes straight into the trash can. So you have to, it's, 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 a, it's a do and tell. It's not, you know, it's mm. not, you know, you can't, you show and you do, and you don't, you don't expound about what you are able in future to be able to do or possibly might exist in your future, which is essentially what the proposal is. So I struggled and I struggled with it. And then someone gave me, actually my agent gave me some very good advice. And um, uh, that, that was Sarah Chalkant, who works with Andrew uh, Wiley, um, and um, who's an amazing reader. Both Andrew and Sarah are amazing readers. And Sarah said, you know what? She said, you're struggling so much, just write the book. Just start writing the book. And when you feel as if you are ready, that's your proposal. Append something at the end of it, but that's your proposal. So instead of spending hour upon hour upon hour writing a book about a book that I was going to write, hmm. I just started writing the book that I was actually going to write. How long did you thrash around before you kind of got to this oh, epiphany? Weeks. I don't know. Weeks, weeks. yeah? Uh, weeks and weeks. Um, and then I started on page one. And, um, and in fact, what's interesting is, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some changes. Mm -hmm. I started on page one. And I wrote about 300 odd pages uh, in, you know, and I didn't tell anyone about it. Um, um, 300 odd pages of the real book. Um, and then approached. Uh, people, uh, agents, uh, sorry, publishers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about it. Um, and, and in bed, writing the 300 pages, this is like with a laptop? With a laptop, With a pen and a... So, I, yeah, I, I, I use a laptop. I'm, I'm, an, I'm you know, we, we, we like to think that we invent new technology in the lab, but being in that position, I'm also incredibly technologically atavistic. I have 
Atavistic. Yeah, yeah. I, I can barely hack a new piece. I'm, you know, there's, a, there's this article that someone read recently about early adopters. So I'm like, I'm the late adopter. <laughs> I'm the person who comes last. Um, so okay. I had a laptop, right. which I okay. adopted to eventually, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. still used pen and paper. I okay. still like pen and paper, so I kept my, you know, my, my recurring uh -huh. notes, I kept on pen and okay. paper. So you're writing this, you're yeah. in bed, you're on a laptop. Yes. Um, you freed yourself from the tyranny of the proposal. proposal yes. No, which is huge, yes, which is huge. a huge barrier. Such a relief. Um, but this is a very, very scholarly book, I mean, in a popular way. It's, it's a history. It's, it's, it's excruciatingly detailed right. um, in its recreations of various moments and characters and, and uh, personalities. And I'm wondering, like, where are all the note cards on the quilt? I mean, are you, how, how are the file folders arranged on, so, on the bedspread? So no, what I would do, what, so what do you say, do? How do you I, do that? My, the physically, what I did is I kept all the notes in, in a diary, physically written in a diary. So I would go to archive. There's a lot of archival work here. A lot of archival work was being done, actually, in New York. I did a lot of archival mm -hmm. work in New York. And I, when I would go to the archives, I would physically take notes. I'd get photocopies, mm -hmm. file the photocopies away, but then mm -hmm. I'd keep a running diary. So in fact, there, there was, uh, while this was, na this was in virtual space right. on a laptop, in real space what I had was a, a you know, a, what became about a 600 or 800 page running diary of notes. Okay. So this is your research notebook. That's my research This notebook. is your lab notebook, yeah, right? There's a tradition here, yes. right? Yes. So you're used to kind of keeping this running that's right. Uh, and I would come back stream to of consciousness, uh, thought process. And it was more than journal. stream of consciousness, for yeah. instance. You know, there would be an article somewhere or the other. Uh -huh. And I would have forgotten it otherwise. So I would, I would physically write that down. If I was more intelligent, I would have some system by which I could do this on the computer, but I can't. So I'd physically write it down. I would say, you know, Papa Nikolaus stain, uh, 19, circa 1940, look up, page this, picture this, that, or the other. Sometimes I would photocopy it, so I'd have a photocopied version of it, but the photocopy didn't make, really I kept that hmm. sort of master book. Um, hmm. And so that, that's how I, you know, that's how, that's the. So this is more, I had to confess that at one point when I was uh, reading this, I guess the second time I read it, I thought, yeah. you know, because I hadn't appreciated where in your chronology this had kind of come, and I, because you spent a long time on it. Yeah. And I saw that it was the product of something that began during your fellow yeah. term. And I thought, oh, you know, are these his class notes? Is this like, you know, everything Siddhartha learned about cancer while he well, was, he is is doing his residency, you know? Yeah. And he just wrote it all down, and now he's rewritten it in a nice, elegant way. And that that's how he did his reporting. Yeah, it's not uh, the but, class but, notes, but it you had a lot more going on here. I yeah. mean, you, you allude to it periodically, oh, a trip to go find so-and-so. Uh, the, 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 his name escapes me, the, the oncologist in South Africa who committed the great fraud. Right, um, Bezvoda. Thank you, who yeah. you actually went looking for yeah. him. Yeah. Um, so I was surprised by this. You insert yourself periodically, very discreetly into this text. Well, but how long did you spend doing the spade work? Um, well, I, I did the spade work right That's through. Something. There was no point that I stopped doing the spade work. I mean, usually, I and mean, this is, again, this is going to sound like a little bit of a truism, but as you know, uh, readers are so smart that they will discover your discovery. Um, they will figure out in a book when you are actually discovering something ah. um, and when you're not, when you're sort of pulling out something from rote knowledge. Um, so for me, usually the answer was al almost always when I was stuck in the book, my answer was go discover it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, um, when I was writing about mammography, which is a, I can assure you, a a, on one hand, politically, a very theory topic. But again, in order to humanize that, in order to put a name to a face, in order to humanize mammography, how does one humanize mammography? Um, I was finding it really hard going writing about trial after trial of failed mammography. And um, my wife at that time was doing a, some work at Malmo. So I said, you know what, I'll go to Malmo. And of course, Malmo is where the final trial of mammography <coughs> happened. Now, was it important to go to Malmo? To in, in the history of writing about mammography, no. But for me, to go to Malmo was very important. Uh, just one other example, um, and actually some of this I didn't even make it to, into the book. Um, there's a section in the book where I was very interested in, I, I talk a lot about um, how crucial and how important, in terms of human knowledge, the structure of human knowledge, these trials that documented the link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer were, mm -hmm. right? The invention of the prospective trial. It was a very important moment in medical history. Um, when you follow subjects, patients, men and women, forward as opposed to going backward because we re our biases, we have very deep biases in recollection. Um, so you follow patients forward. Um, 
So that trial was invented really around solving the link between lung cancer and smoking. So in other words, if you could take a, a group of smokers and a group of non-smokers, and you could follow them forward in time, and you could develop, you could watch the development of lung cancer in one group and not in another group, you could more convincingly prove that there was a link between one and the other. So it turned out to, so I was writing about all of this, and again, I felt really kind of stuck and displaced in it. So I thought I would go to England, where, into the very house, physically, where this was discovered. Um, and, and then I was walking from that house. I took a walk around that vicinity. It's in, it's in Bloomsbury. Mm -hmm. I took a walk around in Bloomsbury out towards the London School of Tropical Health. And if you look up, you're at the London School of Tropical Health, and you figure out, you begin to figure out the connections. Now, these are just physical connections on the balconies of the London people who visited. There on the balcony of the London School of Tropical Health, there are um, these uh, balconies are gilded. They're, they're very, they're, it's a very beautiful building. Mm. They're gilded. And there are these sort of great infectious diseases discoveries of the 19th century. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an Anopheles mosquito is part of the balcony. Oh. And then you walk around, the next balcony is a tsetse fly. And the next balcony is, um, you know, the carrier for Kala Azar. The next balcony is, you know, something like that. And if, if you think to yourself for a second, of course, what you really, what you really experienced, what I really began to experience there, and I'm just, I'm just physically now taking you for this, for this walk, I kept wondering, you know, here you are in the 19th century, and a disease has a simple vector. These things are called vectors. Anopheles mosquito is a vector for malaria because it carries malaria. So here you are in the 19th century. These simple diseases, infectious diseases, they're not simple, pardon me, it's a complete misstatement. But these diseases have identifiable vectors, mosquito, malaria, etc. And then you come to the 20th century, and things start getting so fuzzy. You know, is the cigarette a vector for lung cancer in the same sense that the mosquito is a vector for malaria. Um, and this is the discussion that's happening, really, in the London School of Tropical Health in 1940. People are saying these chronic diseases, like lung cancer, will never have such simple solution. There is not going to be a mosquito for cigarette smoking. There's never going to be a CC fly for diabetes. Um, the, it's too, there are too many factors. It's too, too much that's too complicated. It's just way too complicated. And just to, just to make, give you one more destination in this journey, and that actually, so th that doesn't find its way in the book. If you would then walk a few more steps, you find yourself on Threadneedle Street, hmm. where the actuarial history, the actuarial business is beginning. So this hmm. is a time when shipping is obviously of deep importance. Um, and if, you, if a ship sinks, then you, lo you lose all your fortune. So you have to find a mechanism to, to, to insure yourself against that sinking of a ship. And so all these insurance agents are creating equations hmm. to look at risk. Right? That's what they hmm. do. This is, this is. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't take a big leap of genius or faith to now figure out the connections. So you have to essentially you borrow the equations from the actuarial in industry because they are complex enough to capture real risk in the real world, in a complex world, um, in order to now begin to understand how to understand risk in the medical sense, right? So you really have gone through, if you were to take this walk physically in space, you would have gone through a very important circle in between 19th century and 20th century epidemiology, which is really an important circle in between 19th century and 20th century human epistemic knowledge, right? Starting from the mosquitoes on the balcony mm -hmm. to the, act, the, act, the remnants of the actuarial industry in, in, um, in Threadneedle Street, working yourself back to where Dole and Hill were working out the equations that finally solved the link between lung cancer and smoking. Now, is it absolutely important for you to take this journey, for me to take this journey to solve, to tell the story of cigarette smoking? Well, maybe not to, but to me it was important because otherwise I felt as if my, you know, my own pulse began to lag and I became uninterested in what I was writing. So I said, well, every time I had this kind of situation, I usually just went traveled to some place. Um, whether it was a laboratory, sometimes it was an interview, sometimes it was finding some person. Um, so it became a research project, much like writing, much like any laboratory discovery is a research project. So that was, that's kind of a glimpse into process. How long did you spend on this? On the whole book, you mean? Mm, yeah. So, um, you know, Page to page, uh, end to end, it took about five and a half years. But then there was a, you know, the book like this usually requires about a six to seven month reading period. Um, so in all seriousness, you know, we, we sent, I sent it out to 
at least about 50, 60 people. Um, 50 or field. 60 people yes. that you chose, not the publisher. This is your, chose, own, yes. your own uh, peer review group. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I did, identified my peer review group. I was very diverse. Um, statisticians, you know, uh, Harold Varmus was one of them, hmm. uh, Bert Vogelstein, mm -hmm. George Canellas, Tom Fry, uh, sorry, Tom Fry, I mean, Fry Reich, just everyone in the field. Um, well, so you were very well read before you ever got published. This is not bad. I mean, uh, uh, how did this work? How, how did the feedback come to you? What form did it take? What, so did, these, what did this do for you? Uh, letters, emails. I, that would follow up with emails saying, you know, and I, I had identified specific sections in the book so that they wouldn't, I, I mean, I said, do read the whole book if you can, mm -hmm. but if you're unable to do it, I would particularly like you. I mean, this took a lot of work. Uh, yeah. You know, to, to George Canellis, I would say I'd particularly be interested in your thoughts about um, the history of uh, the development of chemotherapy for Hodgkin's disease, and that happens in page 442 mm -hmm. to 446, and then also in this blah, 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 and blah. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, this is what's wonderful about writing science. Scientists really take this kind of work very seriously and very generously. So George Canellis sent me, um, he doesn't use computers, so he sent me a fax saying, um, you know, this name would be useful to put in this place. Uh, do acknowledge the work of John Ziegler, um, who developed the first chemotherapy against Burkitt's lymphoma in Uganda. And so I went back, and, and meanwhile, my publisher was tearing her hair out because, you know, time was passing, and I said, no, 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 everyone has to read. Um, and so then that was inserted in, or he would say, you know, that piece about, um, this drug is not really right as my memory serves. You look up this, that, or the other. So a long reading period, six or seven months reading period, in which there was a lot of sort of scholarly feedback that I got from people. Okay. Yeah. Well, th this may be kind of opening up something that, that would be interesting for us to explore for a moment, which is, you know, in science, in medicine, you know, there's a rich publishing tradition. Uh, there's a rich uh, uh, educational process to teach you to write. There's a a rigorous, sometimes painful process by which communications about experimental work are hammered into shape and then published. And then there's what happens on the other side of the fence in the, in the trade publishing world, in the world of journalism. I'm wondering, now that you've found the, if you could tell us a little bit about being edited in both worlds. I mean, how, uh, what's the experience like for you writing as a scientist and being peer reviewed and edited that way. And this uh, process on the other side of the fence where you're writing for a trade publisher who, who may or may not uh, uh, take the trouble to actually edit your work. And then it sounds like you created your own peer review system. I'm, I'm, tell us a little bit more about, about this. Well, so, you know, a couple of thoughts about that. One is that um, I, um, w one very important thing is I, uh, this, this peer review panel that I assembled for myself um, was very broad. Uh, included people who had very, very, I uh, very purposely included people who had absolutely no history, were, were, were general readers whose reading I respected, whose, sometimes whose writing I respected, but whose reading I respected more than anything else. So I, let, I went to them and said, well, what parts of the book um, are interesting to you? Where, where do you get stuck? Um, and I, was, I, I listened to them very acutely. I mean, um, and there are parts of the book that are, that are motivated by that. I can point out one section, for instance. Um, yeah. Someone said to me, um, I'd written this book, you know, I'd written, you know, as I said, it was out in review, um, and someone, uh, one very good reader uh, said to me, well, you know, I, I, it's a, I, I, I just don't get Mary Lasker. You know, <laughs> here, is, here she is. Um, she is sitting in... Uh, Tell us who Mary Lasker is. Yeah, so Mary Lasker, um, very interesting persona in the book, um, a, uh, was born in 1900, um, became um, involved in really transforming the geography, the landscape of American health. Um, she has a, a very important quote in the book which says that I'm as opposed to illness as one might be opposed to sin. Um, so she, she, was, she had an evangelical quality in, in, the transfer, in, her, in, in her desire to transform American health and she, uh, very unusually for her time, was a philanthropist. Um, uh, sorry, very unusually for her time, was a, was a, was a very prominent entrepreneur. Um, it was very successful as a businesswoman. Um, married Albert Lasker, who um, people might know from the advertising world, really launches one of the early, you know, one of the great advertisers of America, 
he's part of the reason that we have the, the, the way the iconography of American and actually world advertising works is really a borrowed from Albert Lasker, this idea of what he called salesmanship in print. Advertising should convey information. So Mary and Lasker get ma Mary and Albert get married, and then Mary chooses to take all her philanthropic energy um, and divert it towards American health, uh, particularly cancer. Um, phenomenally successful. Um, and so, but the questions that this woman kept asking me were, well, well, why? Why is this lady who, you know, is a perfectly coiffed Upper East Side lady living in a perfect apartment on Beekman Place with mm. white flowers and uh, a collection of Monet's, why on earth would she become so interested in having the nation cure cancer? And so for me, that, was, that meant going back to the archives and finding the answer. And it turns out that there are three seminal memories that Mary Lasker has, and they're actually in, the, in her archives. She talks about one memory in which she is a child and she, is, she has a febrile uh, bacterial illness. And she, the only memory, it's actually very evocative, the only thing she's, is that she's a child, and the only thing she remembers is someone saying to her mother, uh, her mother's name was Sarah, saying, Sarah, you'll never raise this child. Um, so that memory stuck with her. Um, so that's one. The second memory that she talks about is um, a memory in which she goes to her, she goes with her mother to visit her laundress. Uh, Mary Lasker was obviously very wealthy. She had laundresses. Um, and uh, um, this laundress had, has had breast cancer, this is in the 19, uh, uh, early 20th century, and has had a double mastectomy, a double radical mastectomy. Now, again, I don't write about this in the book, but think for a second, if you're a laundress, of all the professions, mm. if you're a laundress and you have a mastectomy, a, a radical mastectomy, the most common problem with a radical mastectomy is that they would take out the deeper muscles of, of the chest. And to be a long, and, and the two complications, one of them that is that you have, you were often not able to move your, your mm -hmm. upper shoulders. And the second is that you often would get, not often, but occasionally would get lymphedema, very severe swelling because your lymph nodes had been removed. Now think about that as a profession, uh, of all the professions, I mean, there were many affected, um, trying to wash clothes. Um, and so, so that's what I sort of spent time thinking, you know, if you were, a lo if you were Mary Lasker, and you wandered into your laundress's house and she had just had a double mastectomy, a radical double mastectomy, what would that feel like? What would that moment be like? And she writes about it in her book. Um, and then finally, of course, and you can see that, you know, sort of the, the, the bells of history clanging in the back. The mm -hmm. third one is that she writes about uh, an illness that she has in 1918, significantly, uh, in which she is confined to her bed, so ill that she thinks she's going to die. And that, of course, is the flu moving through mm. uh, the United States, oh, the yeah. flu pandemic moving through the United States. Um, and so, again, to answer this woman's question, you know, we, I had to go back in, add, add real detail to flesh out. Um, and so this was what the peer review process was mm -hmm. like. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone would say, and so in contrast, um, Harold Varmus might come back to me and say, you know, I missed, uh, I missed some important character. He said, you know, um, Mary Claire King is missing in this story, the hmm. woman who mm -hmm. partly discovered BRCA1 and subsequently was involved in the discovery of BRCA2. And I said, you're right, Harold, I don't know why, but she is. But you need someone, you needed a perspective like that. And so, mm -hmm. yes, Mary Claire King had to be put back into this book because her role in history is important. So there were all these little pieces of information that was being bombarded by this peer review process that came back. And to me, uh, at least that part of it actually quite resembled writing a paper a scientific paper. You get criticism, uh, a lot of it. Um, your first response is to say, absolutely not, I you know, don't want to listen. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, part of the luxury of, I think, I think part of, part of being, I think, a good writer and a good scientist is to really take a deep breath every time someone sends you some criticism and say, you know, really there's something in there. Um, and to, and get to, to try to suck it up and incorporate those ideas if you can. Sometimes it's physically impossible to do, but. And I, so I, should, I should add too, for the, those of you who are, uh, you know, uh, unfamiliar with the book trade, but, but do a lot of work for magazines, uh, you know, that kind of, of peer review or reader review or even source review that is unheard of uh, in certain kinds of work. And in, 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 in book writing is actually, 
quite welcome and often really incredibly helpful. It, it's a, a great part of the process to incorporate folks, including on a limited basis, uh, you know, even folks who are characters in your book itself. It, it's in just incredibly useful. There may be exceptions to, you know, if you happen to be writing about something that's highly controversial or sure. confidential, but generally speaking, it's an incredibly useful process that mm -hmm. I'm I sure a lot of people do. Book authors do. often complain about uh, not getting the, that quality of editing because the book editors increasingly are in a position where they're kind of forced to act as acquisition editors most of the time. And I, but it does seem this funny thing, Dan, where the more ephemeral the product, the more heavily and strictly and carefully it's edited. I mean, newspapers which last, you know, 24 hours if we're lucky, are intensely edited. I mean, every word has gone over. Magazines are very strongly edited. Um, books, often, you know, the editing is done because the, uh, the author uh, read it again before he or she mailed it in. I mean, that's obviously not in a case like this or, or in, uh, uh, in, in many, but, but increasingly that's something that book authors often complain about. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting irony of our business that, that, you know, the more permanent the product, often the shoddier the editing, uh, or, you know, at least at times. Uh, so it's, it's really important to sort of incorporate, incorporate people who are uh, uh, in, on an informal basis that you may not get in a formal basis. And, and you know, the line edits to me are, were less interesting, have always been less interesting uh, in, in a book like this. The, the really deep insights, one of them I gave you, right, you know, getting into the mind of something and asking mm. a question, which is obviously not a line edit, it's a, edit, it's, a, it's a query about internality, right, what is the interior space of this person, so that was much more interesting to me, and the other kind of edit that was interesting to me is that, the, uh, I talked a little bit about this before, there were two or three major chunks that were moved around in the book, um, and I can tell you what they are. Yeah, no, help, help. Yeah. Uh, because of chronology, because of thematic issues? So what? I tell you, there, there are two, for two separate, very separate issues. Um, the first major chunk that was, um, people who read the book, it, uh, was the Carla story, the, the story that really carries us through the entire book. And the Carla story is? Carla is story uh, of a, patient, a, a yeah. patient of mine who has acute lymphoblastic leukemia um, and will become sort of our, our guide through the book in some respect. We come back to her over and over again. Um, now her story really began in the middle of the book. Um, and so she was moved right up front uh, hmm. in order to introduce the book. Um, and I'll tell you why. Um, it turned out that um, the reason, uh, one thing, again, since I'm, I'm talking to, uh, since this is a really a conversation about, not only about content, but about style. Uh, one thing that's, that, that I'm very aware of, and perhaps readers are as well, is that this book lives in its linings. Um, it really lives in between, in the connection, because there is so much of physical and temporal space that's being covered, really 4,000 years with 200 odd character that's being, mm -hmm. characters that has mm -hmm. been covered. Really in order to tell the story in a reasonable narrative way, it, it really lives in the linings between, mm. between individuals and between spaces. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Of that. Yeah, what do you mean by linings? Yeah. That's a There's a moment in the book when, um, when I'm telling Carla about her first remission, it's a very important moment in the history of any person's leukemia, the first remission, a very important goal, and Carla reaches that milestone. Um, I think it happens in, I, I probably find the space, but anyway. Um, so Carla reaches that first remission, and I, and I tell her this news while I'm standing physically um, a few doors away from where Sidney Farber first discovered mm -hmm. chemotherapy, right? And that is the moment, of course, uh, when I introduce the fact that Sidney Farber's life ends in 1973. So that is a, it's a, it's a lining because you go now from Sidney Farber's death in 1973, right back, in, you jump back or forward in this case to 2005, and really the only connection between them is the fact that I'm physically standing in the same space hmm. where this thing was discovered, this drug was discovered, and this drug, although its creator has died, in this case, Sidney Farber has died, has allowed this woman to have her first remission, right? Now, it's a very complicated series of relationships, but they're all pivoted around the fact that I'm standing at that exact same site. I'm standing right there, and therefore, you as a reader believe me that I've actually created, 
or, or allowed me to go and move as, a, as a, sort of like a wormhole through space and time. So that's one example. And there are many, many such examples. When you read the book, you realize, you know, it turns out, for instance, someone turns out to be someone's uncle, right? Matthew Bailey's uncle was John, was John Hunter. Again, you know, they're physically separ separated in time and space, but that little connection between them allows us to move the story from one generation to the next generation in, to me, it seemed to me a more seamless manner. So the, the, that's what I meant about the book living in its linings. Those linings were really hard to construct um, because what was the connection? How does one move from telling the story of Dolan Hill in 1950 to Papa Nicolau in 1960, right? Some of that connection is scientific. Once in a while, the connection is Papa Nicolau might read Dolan Hill's paper, right? And so it becomes a connection in the sense that he quotes that paper. But some of the connections are, e are even more, how does one move then from Papa Nicolau's paper discussing prevention and screening, how does one move from Papa Nicolau's work to, um, to, the, uh, to Strax's work on mammography, right? The way that I move in the book is in fact, they happen to be, again, we move in physical space in that case. Uh, Papa Nicolau's work is happening on the East River in the 60s. And if you walk, if you were to walk about a few blocks west, you would come to the place where Strax placed his first van for mammography uh, hmm. in, on, along Central Park. Hmm. Um, because women, uh, he, he wanted to get, he wanted to capture women, obviously. Um, and uh, uh, women wouldn't travel because they, when they were working women, they wouldn't travel uptown to clinics. So he decided to outfit a van uh, to put a mammography machine. This is like the mountain in Muhammad, right? He put, uh, machine inside a van and he parked it outside Central Park uh, so that women during their office breaks could come and just get their mammograms done. Um, and so the connection in that case to move from Papa Nicolau's vision of cervical cancer screening to the contemporary vision of breast cancer screening really occurs in physical space. And, and you know, when you read the book, you'll figure, you'll figure out what I'm talking so, about. So all these little tiny little linings that kind of- How arbitrary are you in your research phase of, of being self-conscious and knowing you're going to need you know, this bit of connective tissue, that little bit of connective tissue. I need to go find something that physically links these things. Uh, I better go back to the archive. I better go look for, or, I mean. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's obvious. Because those are very was, key narrative. Oh, it's very, very key narrative. And yeah. they're the hardest to do, actually. Um, sometimes, sometimes they were obvious. Uh, as I said, sometimes someone read someone's paper and really was responding to somebody. You know, science is a conversation. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's, what's, that, that's what makes it. That's what makes our life easier, right? Um, I, I write in the book somewhere, I say, you know, scientists are more interested in history than even historians, because everything that we do is, 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 is a reply to someone else. Every time I write a paper, I'm really writing back to someone in my past, right? This is, this is part of the grand, you know, we, we take it very lightly, but it's amazing that in fact, we're having a grand conversation, which has gone on for about, you know, 600, 700 years. Um, and we're writing back to someone who's a generation behind us or et cetera. But anyway, so sometimes it's easy because mm -hmm. you know, you, someone's reading someone's work and you're replying to someone else's work. But sometimes it's not so easy. Sometimes you don't know why on earth you moved from one vision of screening, for instance, to another. And then you have to find, then you have to really go and try to find something that acts as a spark between one and the other. And that's very hard to, that for me mm -hmm. was very hard to mm -hmm. do. I, I want to ask kind of a, a tone and, and structure question here. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think how to, how to sort of open this particular box. Um, you know, there's a, there's a as, you, as you alluded at the beginning, you go into any bookstore, there's a huge section devoted to cancer. Much of it is prescriptive, right. to be sure. You know, um, cure this, uh, this diet. Uh, but quite a lot of it is, is uh, in, grows out of that Mary Lasker tradition, which right. is this sort of relentlessly um, uh, optimistic, relentlessly propagandistic, relentlessly um, forward into the future toward the big C cure right. tone. The um, weird history of cancer. Yes. Yeah. Um, what you do in this book is interesting. Each of these sections actually is remarkably pessimistic. They sort of almost <laughs> sort of the story of a, of a, of a research uh, uh, effort that has moved forward only by kind of falling over. I mean, and uh, yet the overall pictures somehow it still ends up being optimistic. I'm still trying to figure out how you pulled that off. Um, I, I mean, it was not conscious, but I, what, I wanted to, what I wanted to achieve, as I said, was a, a kind of 
maybe it's, 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 a, it's not the best word, but a kind of scholarly perspective on, on what happened. Um, and often, you know, this, can't, the, 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 this discovery process, like many, has been very Cartesian. You've really had to tumble to the bottom of the, the, the slope in order to climb ourselves back out again, right? So that, was, that really is the structure of the book. You start off with this huge optimism at some point of time in the 1950s, 1960s, and then you keep falling and 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 you, keep falling and you reach the mid-1980s. And, but, but, but you don't do this in the abstract. I mean, put yourself in the, in the position of the woman getting not radical mastectomy, but radical chemotherapy in 1984. You know, Maggie Jenks. Um, who says, who writes very, very poignantly, she says, um, it was like being thrown out of a jumbo jet without a parachute. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and this is a very beautiful passage in her book. It's a thin little pamphlet, uh, very moved me particularly. She said, um, you know, there you are, you're sleeping, you're on a, on a transcontinental flight, you're fast asleep, and someone comes and says, hello, Mrs. Jenks, wake up, wake up, wake up, the door is open, and now you go, go now. And then there she is, and she's, bewildered and she's falling out of the plane and she says to herself, well, what world am I inhabiting? So th that's just an example of, of how bewildering it was to inhabit the, the world of cancer and, and continues to be for, for many reasons. Um, what, what I'm trying to say here is that the, um, the, the, the structure of the book um, had to take into account the fact that this is not a linear history. Not this a is, linear history. Yeah, this is a history that will have five steps backwards to go three steps forwards. And, and we as readers have to be sophisticated now, as science readers, but as readers of anything, as readers of any, any form of fiction or nonfiction, have to be sophisticated enough to be able to contend with that. We, might, we should be able to, be go, to, to go three steps sideways. We should be able to respect each other as readers to be able to go three steps sideways knowing that that will ultimately lead to four steps sideways again maybe, you know. This is, a, this is a discursive process, it's a narrative process. Um, history, particularly the history of science, doesn't happen. Anyone who spent one nanosecond in the laboratory knows that the history of science doesn't happen such that you know, one bit of progress is piled onto another bit of progress like building a Lego. Uh, that's not what happens. Um, we take steps backwards, steps forward, steps sideways. Those are important and those are played out, and this is what's crucial, they are played out in the lives of human beings. Um, you know, um, the, the, these trials rode on the backs of hundreds of thousands of patients. Um, and so, it, it, you know, it, it, would be a, it would be a peculiar falsity um, and it would go against the grain and the tone of this book to write a Whig history of cancer. Um, it, would be, it would be just what I wanted not to do. What kind of response? Now, uh, it's a popular matter. The book has gotten an enormous, uh, enormously favorable reception. But I'm wondering what the response from within the medical community um, has been. Um, there's, you know, a famous track record of scientists who um, do have some knack for reaching out to the public to communicate, uh, find themselves uh, uh, criticized by their peers for uh, unseemly behavior and. Uh, there's some famous examples of this, but I'm just curious if that's well, still the so, case. So to some extent, of course, you know, this, this is not, I hope this is not that kind of book uh, uh, in the sense that, you know, again, I didn't have, this doesn't have a, a again, this goes back to this idea of me not being an expert. Um, I didn't have a, an, a, a, that particular kind of ego agenda to fulfill, so I didn't get that kind mm. of response. But that said, the, the response has been extraordinarily generous. The reviews in Lancet and Nature Medicine have been just as, generous as the reviews in, you know, in, in other places. And so the, the response has been just extraordinarily generous. Um, uh, one thing I, I did, one thing I did do in the book is, you know, I, I, and there's a big disclaimer up front, is actually I was not terribly interested, part of the reason being that I was not interested in writing this big history, um, of saying, you know, he discovered or she discovered something or the other, and then this was followed by that discovery of something or the other, blah, 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 blah. Um, Instead, I, I changed, I hope, I changed the focus of the book to patients. Um, every time there's a story in the book, a major discovery in the book, that discovery is pinned on a human being, and, and I try to get in, I try to discover these people, uh, you know, try to find who the longest-term survivor of 
of leukemia uh, chemotherapy is, who is the uh, longest term survivor of Herceptin. Um, these people should be, I think, icons in our, our history. Uh, these people change the way we imagine the world, we imagine medicine. Um, so by doing that also, I sort of almost decapitated the, the, the monster of scientific rivalry at its face. Mm. I said, you know, this book is not about, I'm not gonna write a book about who discovered something first. Um, I will try to tell the story to the best of my ability, but there's a process within science that rewards um, uh, an appropriate, that there's a whole discursive process that rewards who discovered what first, and scientists can figure that out. My real interest is, you know, who's Barbara Bradfield? Um, who is Robert Sandler? Um, who is Ella, the woman that, you know, survives the first, the first really intensive round of chemotherapy? What, where is she today? What happens to her tomorrow? Um, and by doing so, by shifting the focus, um, what I was trying to say is that, you know, medical history could be written through the eyes of um, scientists and doctors. But to me, that's, that, that, I'm not interested in that. I'm mm -hmm. more interested in the medical history that is written or could be written mm -hmm. from, the, from, the, from the eyes of people who encounter it the most proximally. Mm -hmm. um, to me, their stories are more interesting. Um, and, and whenever, as I said, whenever I was stuck, I, I, had, I generally had two solutions when I was stuck. When I was stuck in this book, my two solutions were go to the place or find the person. Um, and, um, and every time this happened, you know, writing about Herceptin, the discovery of Herceptin, I was writing about the laboratory, et cetera, et cetera, and I said to myself, but where is, you know, where is the woman who was being treated? Uh, I was writing about leukemia, and I, I told the story elsewhere. Um, um, I had to travel 6,000 miles through a series of accidents to find the child to whom this book is dedicated. Um, through a series of accidents. Um, I've told the story elsewhere. So, um, uh, you know, to me that was much more interesting than telling the story of great discoveries by great scientists. Few things, few medical <laughs> issues are as, as thoroughly and obsessively covered in the general media as cancer and cancer treatment and the possibilities of cancer cures, cancer pharmaceuticals. Um, I, I'm sort of wondering from your perspective both as a, as a as an oncologist and as a practitioner, but also as, a, as someone who's, who's, who's displayed some, some skill at writing about this for the general public, what that coverage looks like to you? What are its flaws, what are its virtues? Well, I think one of the questions that is, um, there is an over-granularity in it. Uh, over-granularity, what do you mean? You feel as if you, you're losing the, the uh, forest for the trees, if you simply looking. So in other words, you there is an obsessive quality in which every footstep forward, backward, sideways is covered, leaving open the question of what's the real, what's the real difference. So in, in, in science, we often make a distinction between statistically significant and biologically meaningful. So in other words, you, know, you might have a phenomenon that's different between this and this, and if you sample it enough times, you can make it statistically significant. But the this difference might not be biologically meaningful. So there are many things that are, so, what you're really trying to do in biology, as, as a scientist, I think, is trying to get to what is biologically meaningful. Statistics allows you to generate um, confidence, confidence against biases um, that pre prevent us from having conversations about science. That's what the role of statistics is, right? It allows us to have a conversation about science where you and I can have, a, have that conversation without indulging in a certain series of very traditional human psychological uh, perception, perceptual biases, right? But, but the biological meaning of something has very little to do with statistics. It has to do with the nature of the universe. It has to do with truth. It has to do with truth telling. It has to do with whether one medicine is really changes the, the way we live longer, we live better, we live more dignified lives. That's the real biological meaning. Um, and I think that's what's lost. To me, when I read a newspaper article, I'm saying, you know, this curve showed some increase and it was statistically significant. Who cares if it's statistically significant or not, right? To me, what I'm looking for always is, as a, and as I'm, I'm talking about as a scientist, I'm saying to myself, well, what was it, was it meaningful? I mean, was it meaningful? So just to give you an example, some drug comes along and extends the life of someone by six months. And I'm asking to myself, is that meaningful? I don't mean that in a condescending way. Is it meaningful in the history of this drug, in the history of this disease? Mm. Uh, where has that moved us? Um, you know, in melanoma, we have this new 
drug is immunological therapy, which is it, uh, successful in it was just approved by the FDA two weeks ago, right? Mm -hmm. And it shows an increase in metastatic, advanced metastatic melanoma of about six to eight months um, of increased survival um, in patients who took this drug. And so the question that I'm, when I'm reading this, I'm asking myself, well, tell us a little bit about the history of failed drugs against melanoma. Tell us a little bit about why this is important. And the answer is, this, this idea of awakening the immune system against cancer was really a, fee, a dead field. It was, it was so dead that no scientist would touch it. And so really this drug awakens a dead field. That's to me more interesting than, than, than you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the more minor statistics about the drug. The fact that melanoma was a disease, metastatic melanoma, there was no drug in the history of all chemicals that were ever tried that had changed the survival of patients with metastatic melanoma. So I'm gonna repeat that because it's so important. There was no drug in the history of metastatic melanoma that in a randomized trial, to my knowledge, had increased the lifespan of a patient. Um, that's why this drug is important because it proves the principle. It begins, it opens a new story. Um, now, to me, that's, all of this is very important. Reading an article about how someone's life was increased by six months, to, I'm not so impressed by. So you think there's a, a misplaced focus on? There's a misplaced focus on what progress means. There's a misplaced understanding of what is, what is forward, what is backwards. Um, there's a misplaced understanding of, again, I think that every footfall gets covered so acutely, you know, everything becomes so acutely covered that you begin to misplace. Uh, you don't get the sense of what, to me, what, often I don't get the sense from reading what the real, what the real meat is, what the real importance is of something. So that's my, that's my personal bias. Sid, do you feel that uh, blogs are delivering that in a way that conventional daily journalism doesn't? Uh, I don't read blogs. It's just an interesting point because you get, you get more of a discursive kind of approach often. Yeah. Maybe. You know, that you know, traditional journalists like me would look at and say, well, that's rambling, but, <laughs> but other other people might look at it and make the same point that you're making, which is that, no, th this, is, this is storytelling and, it's, and it's, it's not creating some sort of false novelty or out of context novelty. And instead it's, it's trying to tell a bigger story in, in pieces. Right. Uh, and in a sense, something is happening in journalism where we're, we're, we're seeing more of that. You know, we're seeing more of an emphasis on on the story and a little bit less on the OMG, look, here's what's new. Right, you know? right, 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 yeah. right. I, I, yeah, I hope so. It's, I mean, I think some of that is important. I, I, I don't, I unfortunately don't read blogs. So I don't know what, <laughs> what, I don't like to read them. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it's a matter of kind of self-discipline too. <laughs> or I, I, in your copious spare time, you don't yeah, have to. Yeah, yeah. So in your copious spare time, um, you spent a number of years on this project. Is this a, is this a, is this, is this a one-time uh, uh, thing in the, uh, in, the, in the life of Siddhartha Mukherjee, or is this something that you now have developed a set of muscles, a set of uh, literary uh, uh, techniques, habits, uh, established your primacy to your half of the bed of the working area? And, uh, you know, there is a, there is a tradition um, uh, happily being revived with uh, many of your colleagues who regularly now write not necessarily about their specialty, but out of their specialty. Um, uh, group, I you know, Jerome Groupman, Ethel Gwandi, there are others um, who then inform uh, yeah. coverage. Um, yeah. I mean, is that something that you plan to do or have you, have you uh, had your great success and you're going back to the lab while you're ahead? <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, you know, I think this book was written to answer a question. And what uh, was the question? The question is, what is the history of cancer? So um, the, if I have a question, then I will write another book. <laughs> As opposed to writing a book for the sake of writing a book. I mean, you know, I have to think of a question first. If there's a question that's worth, to me, that inspires an interesting series of thoughts and answers, I will try to answer that question. But to me, the, to me at least, as a writer, for me personally, books work best when they answer questions. 
and this book was written to answer a question. I'm going to wait until I have another good question, and I'll answer that question in the book. How do you think that, how do you think that question was different? How do you think how, that how, how was, you know, what is the history of, of cancer? Why was your question, or, or more importantly, your answer, different given the fact that you're an oncologist? I mean, and, you know, how, how you know, in, in some obvious ways it affected the book strongly. You know, it, it gave you a, a base of tremendous knowledge. But beyond that, it seems to me that it, it may have had a sort of a more reaching, a more far-reaching uh, effect of, of how you chose to answer that question. So what, why don't you talk a little bit about that, maybe? I mean, you know, it's, uh, being an oncologist and writing a book about cancer is, is fundamentally a humbling experience. Uh, you know, you, you don't need to read very much deeply into this book to figure out from its first chapter that that big problems are generated and they generate even bigger problems um, mm. called the radical mastectomy, radical chemosect. I could name the whole history of our sullied uh, discipline. Um, so some of it was to contend with that. Um, but then there are unusual parts of the book. I mean, I'll just give you one more example. Um, uh, there's a part of the book, um, sometimes it's, I, I, I learned this from my wife was a sculptor, um, and, and Sarah says sometimes um, it's very important to do something very wrong in the middle of a book or in the middle of a, uh, something that's so wrong that it actually stylistically becomes right. Um, there's a point of the book that I really that I really debated, and there's a part of the book I'll, I'll tell you exactly which part it is. Part of the book in which I talk about the birth of my daughter um, in the hospital, mm -hmm. Lila's birth, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I mean, you know, you can insert yourself in a book in different ways. And now, in this very somewhat flat-footed part of the book, I was not only inserting myself as, a, as an oncologist writing about the history of cancer, now I was talking about a father writing about the birth of my daughter in a hospital where I happened to practice oncology, right? So now I've not only taken myself away from the, the, the relatively comfortable zone of authority, um, or even of discovery, as I said, I didn't want to be an expert, I didn't want to be the, to have that voice of authority, but taken away from that place and, and started talking about being a father as well as simultaneously being a doctor um, and being within the same hospital where I practice my subspecialty. And so I, I went through this complicated process of trying to eliminate that, that um, piece from this book. Um, and then Nan said, you know, every time I read that passage, I keep coming back to it. Um, and she said it keeps, keeps haunting me, this idea of you sitting there cutting Leela's umbilical cord uh, and harvesting her stem cells. And then I said, well, then why not put it in? I mean, why not keep it back in? And readers will figure out, really, what the connections are then between, uh, between all of those things. So that's just one example of ways in which the way that you in, in, intersect um, in my case, my academic discipline with my writing can become very complicated. And sometimes that very weird flat-footed complication is actually fits uh, because that's the way you really feel it. Just to follow up on that, you know, one of the things that we, we tell ourselves in journalism, just one of the stories that we tell ourselves about how important we are, uh, is that we like to say that you know, we're the surrogate for the reader. We understand the reader in, in the sense that the expert, you know, never can, and, and therefore we, de we deliver the story in a way that, that uh, someone who actually knows what they're talking about, like you, uh, can't. You know, your, your book puts the lie to that. <laughs> but beyond that, I'm wondering, like, when you, this is what I was trying to get at before, when, when you said, you know, the question that, that inspired you was what is the history of cancer? Are you, do you feel you're asking that as an oncologist, as somebody who already really knows a lot about cancer, or are you somehow trying to be someone else? Are you trying to be uh, you know, this ideal reader? And therefore, in doing so, how does that change the process? I mean, who are you really writing for? Are you writing for yourself, or do you have some imagined reader that you're I, I mean, for? I had an imagined person. I had an imagined reader. Um, uh, I was 
I was not writing as an oncologist. I mean, I was writing outside. It happened to be that I was an oncologist that I had a certain set of, I mean, this is how I really imagined it. I said to myself, I have a certain set of advantages and a certain set of disadvantages in writing this book. I have a little bit of a, a, a wealth, a fund of knowledge. But really, if you were, a, um, if you were, um, if you were a journalist um, and you did the legwork, you would find this fund of knowledge. This fund of knowledge is not private knowledge. Um, I'm not Jim Watson writing about the discovery of DNA being Jim Watson in Cambridge in 1950 something um, at that moment of time. Um, so that knowledge is, I'm not privy to that knowledge. This is common knowledge. Um, so that's one aspect of it. But then on the flip side to say that I'm not part of the process, not of the genesis of the knowledge, but part of the process immersed in it would, is also to deny the reality of who I was writing from. There's a book that um, that I that actually quite like that that there there are versions of, of you know, there's a kind of it's a much it's it's a it's a thinner mm -hmm. book, um, in um, in which uh, um, uh, Adam Wishart tries to get to the history of cancer through the diagnosis of his father's cancer prostate cancer, um, and again mm -hmm. there is you know, he's a journalist he has the capacity to access the fund of knowledge, but really it's his father's cancer that that motivates him to write this book, it's, that becomes a driving force. And for me, it was discovery. It was answering the question, but not answering the question, what is the history of a cancer to the oncologist? Uh, to me, it was what is the history of cancer in human intellectual life, in our, our common shared intellectual history? Um, because this disease is, is clearly of that importance, uh, that we need to have uh, a, a a conversation about it in the public realm, which transcends the, the minor discoveries of the history of oncology. I don't know if I'm answering the question. It was written very actively to a lay, uh, to a lay reader. Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about something you were saying earlier. I just thought it was, it was interesting that you were talking about some of your peer reviewers that were your colleagues got back to you and, and they were saying, you know, you left some of these names out, some of these people that I think you should put in and, and I mean, particular with cancer, cancer, there's probably thousands of people you could have put in, and I feel like that's kind of typical with science journalism, is that even if you're writing about one paper, you know, you talk to somebody and they want you to mention all of their colleagues and everybody who's contributed it, and you go to your editor and they're like, no, you're crazy, you can't put all those people in because your reader will fall asleep before they get through all the names, and I'm yeah. just wondering if, if you ever kind of found yourself in that place where you had to choose between um, telling a story that was readable and clear and making sure you put in everybody that yes. deserved credit and what did you decide that's or how very did you important, decide? That's a very important question and, and so you know I, I, I struggled with it a lot um, and clearly there were many many instances where that happened. I said I gave you one thing I said I, I immunized myself, I vaccinated myself against some of this up front by saying, I'm not going to tell the stories. Uh, you know, you guys, um, there's a complicated and, and very well-established scientific process by which, uh, by which reward is given. You figure it out yourselves. Um, I'm, not, I'm not going to, you know, there's a big, I, I, write about, I wrote about it right on the author's note up front. Um, it's your business. Um, so so it requi I think it requires a certain kind of self-confidence or confidence to do that. To say, you know, the story is, everyone knows, you know, I know, the story is more complicated than I'm just telling you this. But here are the important milestones of the story because milestones need to be drawn because otherwise the story will not be told. So that's, that's one piece of it. The second piece of it was, and follows from the first, and I said, well, there are discoveries being ma made every day. Um, my sniff test for something getting into this book was, does that discovery, has that discovery had a human impact? Um, so I'll give you an example. There's a lot written about telomerases, right? Very important in the history of uh, developing history of cancer. But telomerases are yet not, have not converted themselves. They're still a scientific reality, a laboratory reality, but we don't have an anti-telomerase medicine, for instance, right? There's no patient whose life has been changed, as far as I know, by the discovery of telomerase, right? That will happen. I hope it'll happen eventually. But that was sort of my threshold. Um, uh, the, the, the discovery of the molecular oncogene has changed the way we imagine patients, the way we, we treat them, BRCA1, BRCA2. I could tell you story upon story. So that, that was one criteria. Um, and that allowed me to, to, to really draw kind of a, a, 
a strong line discrimination between what could be included and what could not be included. And then the final thing was in the, whenever I had to choose between um, a, a scientist story and a scientist story that was linked in or tied in to a patient story, I always chose the latter. So I allowed the patient. So, so the reason that Dennis Lehman comes into the story is because of Barbara Bradfield's story, which needs to be, which I thought needed to be told. So everyone, the scientists become the satellites around the, the, the main orbits are our patients. So that was just the way I chose to, to tell the story. Right, thank you. Yeah. So when you're reaching out to the patients and the patient's family, what does that email or phone call sound like? And what was sort of the range of responses you got from patients? In terms of writing the book uh, or in terms of? No, in the process when you reached out to a patient or somebody living or somebody's family who had passed away, what um, was that sometimes like? They, sometimes they didn't want to talk about it, sometimes they didn't want to be interviewed. I mean, I kept everything anonymous. Um, I changed some. I changed some critical pieces of identity to keep with so that I wouldn't violate HIPAA, for instance. Mm. Um, and that was complicated. I tried not to do it. Um, there, uh, but essentially, I tried to, keep, tried to keep to what the real experiences were. Um, some of them were very forthcoming. You know, the woman with uh, the woman who, um, I'll just tell you one story. I, uh, the, um, I, I was looking for a long time to find this woman who was the longest term survivor of, uh, of VAMP chemotherapy. Um, and um, the first, uh, the first cures of childhood nephrologic leukemia. Um, and um, the way I found her was I was looking on Amazon for a medical textbook, a textbook on cancer. And then the nice thing about Amazon is that's like a library these days. You go from one thing to another thing to another thing. And somewhere along the comments of one of these, it was not a textbook, it was really a memoir on cancer. This woman had written, I survived childhood leukemia in 1950. And I had been so accustomed by that point of time to figuring out that, you know, depending on what age you were, I knew exactly what therapy you would have gotten because I was looking up this history. So, I, you know, based on what she said, I said, this has to be, she has got to have been treated with them. Um, she has got to be part of the first cohort. So I just called her up blindly. Hmm. Um, and I said, you know, I introduced myself. I think I wrote an email first. I introduced myself and I said, you know, here's my identity. I'm trying to write this book. And she said, of course, I was treated with that drug combination. I was treated with VAMP. I have, you know, I'm, I still have severe neuropathy hmm. from the vincristine. Um, and so then I drove out to Maine to see her. She was in Maine and that's how, uh, you know, that's how I found her. Some people, ha yeah, there were different, you know, there were different thresholds. Um, I tried to respect whatever people had to do. There, there was certainly plenty of cases to choose from. Um, this I think you turned it off. Um, hi. Yeah, there you go. Thank <laughs> you. So when you were writing these emails um, to patients or when you were calling them, did you mention your affiliation with the, whatever university you were at the time or were you writing this book as like sort of a private citizen? I mean, did you keep your email signature? Uh, I, I'm not, I don't remember exactly what I did in terms of whether I did on occasion say that I was from... But I tried, I tried to mention, uh, the most important thing is that I tried to mention that I was writing a book. Um, I don't remember whether I said I was, I mean, I certainly did say I was an oncologist, because that, that would you know, not make any sense otherwise. I don't remember if I mentioned exactly what my credentials were. Can you tell us a little bit more about the child to whom you dedicated the book? Yeah, um, <laughs> say, you know, um, so for some people, this might be a repeated story, but I'll tell it anyway. Um, um, so as I said, m my writing process, it, my, my writing process is very linear. Um, and so I, although I, so I kept a recurring set of notes, but I was, I was writing in a very linear manner. Um, and, so I was a, uh, and I had promised myself as one of the things in the tone of the book that I would in fact um, try, to, try to find patients. Um, and so I was writing about Sidney Farber's discovery of, of the first chemotherapy, methotrexate. Um, and I knew that he had these flickering remissions in 1948. Um, by the way, I, I was just recently finished a month of rounds uh, 
And I, began, I begin my month of rounds um, by noting that in 1947, 1948, in 1955, every child with lymphoblastic leukemia died, every single one of them, 100%. Um, today, we cure about 80% of these children, maybe sometimes 90%, depending on the genetic backgrounds. And one of the things about being an oncologist, one of the peculiarities about being an oncologist is that we won't know, we will never know whether we are living in the 1955 of metastatic melanoma or we will continue to live in the 1955 of metastatic melanoma for our generations. That uncertainty is that, it, it, you know, for an intern or a resident or, and actually for an, for, a, for an attending to swallow that uncertainty is very complicated. Um, and the only way I think that one swallows that uncertainty is by figuring out that in 1955, when they were treating these children, um, you know, someone could say to them, well, why bother? Why go through the motions? It's a 100% lethal disease. Um, why go through the motions of iterative trial running? Um, this child is going to die anyway. Um, and the problem is that, that the uncertainty is ultimately what generates uh, a kind of scientific hope for us, because we don't know and we'll never know. We won't know if this new drug or this new trial or this new thing that you're trying for someone with melanoma or advanced stage breast cancer is going to make a difference, or as I said, whether we're going to. And so it's, it's, it's an amazing situation. It's sort of like the uncertainty is like the vaccine against the nihilism, uh, because mm. you can become so nihilistic in oncology. Um, uh, and, and, and so that's, you know, that's the, that, that's just a quick aside. So very quick uh, answer to you know, how I found the story. Um, so I was looking for this, for this series of children, this cohort of children, and I couldn't find them anywhere. Um, and then I was, got dejected and I tr took a trip to India, to my parents' house in India. Um, and someone said, there was a bi Sydney Farber had collaborated with a chemist in discovering this chemical. The chemist was an Indian chemist. Uh, his name was Yela Subarao. Um, <laughs> And there's a biographer. Yella Subra has only one biographer. So someone said, go talk to the Yella's biographer. So he happened to live a few blocks from my parents' house in Delhi. So I said, fine, I'll go talk to Yella's biographer. Um, so I went to Yella's biographer. We talked for an hour and a half. And as I was leaving, he said to me, um, by the way, I visited Farber's clinic in 1948. And I have a roster of all his patients that he was treating because I was working on Yella's biography. And I kept newspaper cuttings with pictures of these kids. Uh, would you be interested? Uh, so I said, yes, absolutely, I'm interested. And so I found, therefore, in that clipping set, I found the child's name and his face. Um, and so here it became a metaphor for me that, you know, 6,000 miles away from where I was in Boston trying to find this child, but 6,000 miles away is where I ultimately found the child. And I could come back to Boston and then discover, I actually, I talked about going to places I could find his name, uh, I found his name obviously in the, rec in the, in the uh, city records, his death certificate in the city records, I could find his house. And then 15 minutes away from where I originally started, having gone right around the world, I could make a 15 minute journey and I could stand in his house. I went to his house and I looked out through what his house was on Blue Hill Avenue until I had physically found myself in the place where this child had was born and died. Um, there's a quick epilogue to the story and that is so I dedicated my book to Robert Sandler, his name was Robert Sandler, and uh, the quick epilogue to the story is that my book was published, and 10 days after the book was published, uh, Nan Graham called me up and said, you know, you really need to sit down. I was writing a grant in my office, and she said, you need to sit down, because there's a phone call. So I picked up the phone, and it was this child's twin. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Elliot Sandler, and he had walked into a bookstore in Maine, he lived in Maine, I would have never found this family, walked into a bookstore in Maine, opened the book, and found the dedication to his brother, um, mm. who had died 70, 60 something years before. Um, and so you asked me about you know, what, how people, what the reception of this book has been. The, the nicest phrase that I got from this, for this book, and I'll close on this note, the nicest phrase is that Helen Sandler, the mother, whose picture is in the book actually, was, is still alive, and the Sandlers are Jewish. Um, and when Robert had died at three years old, the farmer had begged Helen to allow him to autopsy the child. Um, and Helen had said, no, that's a violation of the body. I'm not gonna allow you to open this child's body up. Um, and finally, after a lot of begging, she had finally agreed. Um, and she said that the decision had haunted her for 67 years uh, because she kept coming back to it over and over again.
Um, and the nicest thing that anyone has ever said about this book is that it brings, for Helen, she said that that brought her chapter to a close. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's the amazing thing about writing about medicine is that you think you're writing about something, but in fact you're writing to someone else about something else, and the world moves around in complicated temporal and physical circles. I, you I, know, had a... a oh, I, I, d Go ahead. No, no, please. Oh, I, I, I just wanted to make sure that people know who our next questioner is. I, I know my yeah. students may not know. Um, this is Professor Saketu Mehta, uh, who is a wonderful nonfiction writer and a great resource here at the Institute for my students and others. So, Saketu, raise your hand so we can all see who you are. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, here, I'll give you the microphone. Thank you, Diane. Um, Siddharth, I'd like to ask you about a question related to storytelling. So you do these two very different kinds of writing. One is the scientific. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little muddy. Yeah. So oh, uh, there you go. So there you go. I'd like to ask about storytelling. What you do these two different kinds of writing. One is in the scientific journals and uh, uh, peer-reviewed studies in Nature, etc., which have to be clinical, bereft of emotion. And then there's this book, which uh, has this wonderful narrative drive to it. And I know you read a lot of fiction, and which clearly has informed the book. But also you're, you're not just any kind of doctor. You're not a, um, I don't know, a dermatologist. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. You, you, you have to tell people that you know, they're going to die. Yes. Uh, so in that in delivering that kind of diagnosis, um, there must be a narrative that accompanies uh, this delivery of this news. And so I'd like you to talk about how these things are related, how you deal with that kind of um, the emotion of dealing with your patients, how that uh, has influenced your book, maybe that produced a need in you to write this book, because that, that chapter about your daughter, I found very affecting. and. I think it would have been a lesser book without stories like that. So how did you um, uh, infuse this book with that kind of emotion, which really it took it beyond the usual run of medical books and made it so widely accessible and, right. and so necessary for people who um, may, not, may only have a passing acquaintance with, with the disease? Right. Well, I, I have a couple of thoughts about it. One thought is that you, know, you have to be in, in writing about medicine, I think you have to, you have, to have a very, you have to titrate the emotion very carefully. Um, and that's why I went back, I referred again back, I would refer you back, to me, I referred myself back to Primo's book. Um, mm -hmm. y y how does one learn from the master of that craft the, the writing of that? I mean, there's a wonderful interview which I read over and over again in which many years later, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, um, he was asked why he survived. Uh, uh, the camps. And he said, by the way, people know that he was a chemist, uh, and his chemistry very deeply informed his, his writing. He's written about that um, in the periodic table, for instance. Um, but he said something very interesting to me. He said, I survived because of two reasons. Number one, I was young, and number two, I spoke a little bit of the language. I spoke a little bit of German. Now, hmm. think of a sec second for this answer, about this answer, right? The, the lack of heroism in that answer um, the, the, not only the humility, but the granularity of it, um, the smallness of it. Um, to me, that was very important. Um, so that was the kind of, that was the kind of Im emotional titration that I think is important in writing a book. You can't, uh, uh, grief in this book, or in any book like this, can become its own overindulgence. Um, doctors grieve. Uh, doctors should grieve, uh, but you know who are you to grieve? I mean, you, you know, that, you know, it's like someone. It's like when you go to a doctor and you say, you know, I have a headache, and the doctor says, you have a headache. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, you know, y y your grief as a physician is always put into context of the much greater griefs of of patients. So you have to realize that upfront. You didn't deal with it, but on the other hand, you're a human being. I'm a human being. I go through the process of grief. There's a man in the hospital that we tried in my sort of, I mean, just went through this. I was, you know, this is what, this is a peculiar thing about how intense medicine is. Um, I was, on, as I said, I was on call for a month before. 
and um, I had a series of patients, and I had this, there was a young man, um, and I'm again not violating any laws when I, when I tell you about the story, young man with leukemia, um, a relapse, uh, not relapse, sorry, a leukemia, who came in, who is from the Dominican Republic, and I became, this was part of my, it brought out some kind of incipient heroism in me, I thought I must save this man, you know? Uh, imagine that sort of moment of pride that you have, right? I must save this man. Um, so, and, and my, my fantasy about this man was that I was, I was going to bridge him to a transplant. I was getting transplanted, his leukemia was not responding to chemotherapy. I would give him enough chemotherapy and I, his transplant could only be done in Bethesda. And I kept saying to myself, if I could just get him on the train to Bethesda, I'd, I'd be a happy man. So I called up Bethesda, we'd organized all of this. Called up Bethesda, they were ready to receive him. They have a, they have a cord blood donor. And I had this fantasy, this person, you know, if I could just see him off on the train, I would be a happy person. And so this morning, this, this afternoon, actually, as I took, this, I took the train back to come to NYU, I finished my month, I wrote it off for about three days, and I'm just beginning to do follow-ups, and I meet one of the interns who's coming off her night shift on the train, and I say, well, what's going on with Mr. L, because I'm going to go to tomorrow, and she says to me, he's relapsed. Um, and so, so my whole train ride, essentially, it becomes this kind of weird ride into a, into a tunnel. Right. I mean, here I am, just you know, kind of thinking of myself as the great, big hero. And I had this fantasy for three days. You know, I'm going to go back. He's going to he's going to be fine. He's going to go. <laughs> and he's going to go to his train, go to the Tesla, go to get transplant. Everyone's going to be happy, happy and hunky dory. And so, and meanwhile, so I sat for about 40 minutes, thinking to myself, you know, how, how, anyway. Hmm. Um, so. I think you know when you write. Well, the reason I'm telling you the story is I think when you write about medicine, you have to find the right titration, um, and it's not obvious what that titration is. Um, it really lives inside the actual fabric of the writing. Um, very unsatisfying answer. Though. No, it's a very satisfying answer actually. Um, I've been brooding about a question earlier and about why you write and the nature of communication, and you know. Authors insert themselves in their books, and you have certainly inserted yourself here uh, quite artfully and and, uh, and intentionally. But when authors do that, they also occasionally hold a mirror up to themselves. And there is a moment <coughs> in here which I'd like to read to you. Very interesting. It's actually the one un the one moment of unalloyed admiration in this entire book. <laughs> That's good. It involves a lung cancer specialist named Thomas Lynch. Hey. And you are with him. He's about to see a patient, a 66-year-old woman, who is very afraid she's about to get a death diagnosis. And I'll read a passage here, if I may, because I think it goes to the heart of something about your medical writing and why you might do it. I was about to enter the room when Lynch caught me by the shoulder and pulled me into the side room. He had looked through her scan and her reports. Everything about the excised tumor suggested a high risk of recurrence. But more important, he had seen Fitz folded over in fear in the waiting room. Right now, he said, she needed a something else. A resuscitation, he called it cryptically, as he strode into her room. I watched him resuscitate. He emphasized process over outcome and transmitted astonishing amounts of information with a touch so slight that you might not even feel it. He told Fitz about the tumor, the good news about the surgery, asked about her family, and then spoke about his own. He spoke about his child who was complaining about her long days at school. Did Fitz have a grandchild, he inquired. Did a daughter or a son live close by? And then as I watched, he began to insert numbers here and there with a light-handedness that was a marvel to observe. You might read somewhere that for your particular form of cancer, there's a high chance of local recurrence or metastasis, he said, uh, perhaps even 50 or 60%. And she nodded, tensing up. Well, there are ways that we will tend to it when that happens. I noted he had said when, not if. The numbers told a statistical truth, but the sentence implied nuance. We will tend to it, he said. 
not we will obliterate it. Care, not cure. The conversation ran for nearly an hour, and in his hands, information was something live and molten, ready to freeze into a hard shape at any moment, something crystalline, yet negotiable. He nudged and shaped it like glass in the hands of a glass blower. That moment of necessary resuscitation through information, I think, is what you've done so marvelously in this history of cancer. And I thank you for taking more than an hour uh, with us in our room to talk to us about why you write and how you do it. And, you know, we, um, I uh, have learned a couple of really interesting things in our conversation, and I thank you for that, and I thank you so much for coming up here this evening. Thank you. Thank Thank you for the lovely questions. They were very informative. You certainly. Um, we still got a uh, few bottles of uh, wine left and a little <laughs> food, so drink. help yourself. <laughs>